Good morning, and welcome to the Terry Leadership Speaker Series. My name is Olivia Bassel, and I'm a senior Leonard Leadership Scholar studying marketing and finance. The Institute for Leadership Advancement in the Terry College of Business develops values-based, impact-driven leaders that give back to their community and organizations. ILS instills leadership values that are layered on top of the leader's academic courses. ILA promotes self-development, effective communication, teamwork, innovation, and adaptability in a changing global environment. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing to you an athlete, bulldog, husband, father, author, founder, and leader. These are just a few of the many titles that reflect the heart and dedication of Benjamin Watson. This University of Georgia finance major was not only picked in the first round draft for the New England Patriots, but also received a Super Bowl ring his rookie season. In addition to that, his athletic career led him to play for the Cleveland Browns, the New Orleans Saints, and the Baltimore Ravens. In 2005, he joined the team he is most proud of when he married Leonard Leadership Scholar and college athlete, Kirsten Vaughn Watson. Valuing family, Benjamin is a loving father to his five children. He also serves as an NFL spokesman in the All Pro Dad campaign. Valuing faith, he published his first book, Under Our Skin. Finally, valuing servant leadership, he co-founded the nonprofit organization Once More. We are so excited to hear from this values-based leader today. Also joining us is Michael McDonald. He is the defensive back coach for the Baltimore Ravens. Mike was an undergraduate finance major here and was in the class of the Leonard Leadership Scholars 2010. He earned his master's in sports management while working for our very own Georgia Bulldogs. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to both Benjamin Watson and Michael McDonald. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's good to be home. Okay. All right. Um, I just got to do this one time. So, go. No. Sick of Woo! Yeah. I had to do it. You don't understand. You don't understand. It's like I've been, I've been in exile for like the past, I don't know, 15 years. Like, so. I'm so excited to be here. When I, when I drove in, I was like, man, I was getting goosebumps coming down 316, and then also the traffic was making me upset. <laughs> I was like, I thought they were supposed to deal with this traffic thing. Like, when I was in Still college. Still two lanes. Exactly. Though. That Still was supposed to be lanes. over. They were saying, we're going to have, we're, we're gonna have a highway. There's going to be exits. You know, it's going to be like a fast pass to go through. No fast pass. It's still There's traffic. supposed to be a train, right? So, yeah. What happened to that? Well, can I get on a train and get to Atlanta in like 30 minutes? Well, no. What happened to that idea? I don't know, man. It was yesterday. We were on campus, remember? Yes. Not enough time to make that happen. Yeah, clearly 15 years isn't enough. Anyway, <laughs> it's great to be here with you guys. Great having Benjamin here. You guys are in for an absolute treat today. The podcast we did prior to this was fantastic. Um, but before we get going, I just wanted to thank uh, Dean Ayers. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the support for the ILA program. For me personally, uh, life changer. I mean, just one of the absolute best things I did in my, in my career here at UGA. Uh, wanted to shout out to Dr. C for joining us, Dr. Vicki Clausen. Uh, she's fantastic. Uh, thank you for the ILA family for putting this thing together, organizing it. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make this happen, and uh, you guys are in for a treat. So um, thank you, everybody, and let's get this thing going, man. Let's go. Come all the way down from Baltimore to <laughs> talk in front of a few folks, talk about some leadership. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about was this idea of a leadership journey. So there's a lot of students, you know, about to start their, you know, their careers and their organizations, and you know, you don't just pop in day one and all of a sudden you know, you're the guy or, or girl they, they look to. So could you talk about your first experiences joining the Patriots? So Benjamin was a first round draft pick in 2004. Yeah, many moons ago. Yep. And as we know, the Patriots, I mean, as much as I hate to admit it, you know, they're, they're the standard in the NFL. And uh, just curious to hear about your, in, your initial impressions with the team and, and, and how you led you know, as a rookie, even if, if you did. Yeah, well, the first thing, as a leader, you learn what not to do. Um, and so you come in as a rookie, and, and rookies are supposed to be seen and not heard. Um, and that's made very clear to you from uh, the head coach, Coach Belichick, all the way on down. Rookie, shut up. Just do your job. 
go get my donuts. That's what you do, <laughs> as, that's what you do as a rookie. So um, part of that experience in leadership was understanding your role. I think um, as you go throughout life, leadership takes on different um, forms. Um, there are some times where you're the vocal leader. There's some times where you are the leader who leads through your actions. There's sometimes you are the servant leader. Um, you're the one who's behind the scenes. They're all valuable. They all have a purpose. They all have a reason, and they're all needed. Um, every leader isn't the one that's seen on television or the one that is the spokesperson, but they're still, uh, they're not any more important than the one who uh, is behind the scenes. And so for me, I, 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 I had... Uh, I had some great leaders in front of me. I had guys like you may know, guys like uh, Teddy Bruschi and Richard Seymour, who played here at University of Georgia, Mike Vrabel, uh, Rodney Harrison was one of our safeties. These are veteran players who I look to uh, as leaders. And, and the number one thing I learned from them is their authenticity. If they were a guy that was going to shout and scream and encourage people, they were going to make plays on the field. They were guys who were accountable. Uh, they were willing to take risks. And I think throughout my career, uh, part of me being a leader and growing as a leader is sometimes stepping outside of what might be my comfort zone because of the need of our organization, in this case, our team. So there are times when you may not be the vocal person, like I'm not a very vocal leader on the field a lot of times, but there are times when I needed to be that person. Sure. And that's, that's leadership. You know, leadership is understanding what needs to be done at a specific time and even if it's not in your realm of possibilities of what you think you should do, you're willing to do it for the common good of your group. Um, and so that, that's kind of changed throughout my career. You know, I'm going on my 14th year. Um, can't believe I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on my 14th year, and I would say that uh, you know, I'm a different leader now um, than I was coming in, partly because I'm more confident of myself. I have a, a track record that demands a certain amount of re respect wherever I go. Um, and that's great, but also you understand that th the way you lead the most is by, is by serving other people. It's, it's by them being comfortable talking to you and also by how you duplicate, duplicate yourself. Um, great leaders I've seen on football teams as well as in other areas of uh, other walks of life are people who um, have someone that they are following, someone that they hold in high regard that they want to imitate, but they're also people who are willing to create copies of themselves minus the bad things. There are people who are pouring into someone that's younger. So there's, this, there's this, um, this lifespan, I think, of leadership, or there's this timeline, if you will, of leadership, where you, you're wherever you are, and there's people that are behind you that you're pouring into and teaching and pulling along and challenging. And then there's someone else who may be further along in your occupation that you respect, that you're drawing from them, and you're, you're seeing the, the successes and the failures that they've gone through. Um, and you're imitating what they do. That's awesome. So practically speaking, you mentioned mentorship and eventually being a mentor for the people that follow you. Yeah. When, when, when these students get to their organization, other than just knowing when to shut up, I mean, are, yeah. are there some practical pieces of advice that you have for them, mm -hmm. you know, as they take their first step into an Ernst & Young or a yeah. company? X. Definitely, definitely. So as was mentioned before, my wife, um, uh, Kirsten, uh, we actually, I met her at the Tate Center, the old Tate Center. Um, <laughs> I don't know this new monstrosity that we have here. Um, I met her there. We actually had some classes together. We had a Dr. B.A.'s class together. Uh, we had a finance class together. She was a marketing major, and she was in the inaugural class of, of the Leonard Leadership Scholars. And, um, and one thing that she would always say is, uh, is that she would, she would, uh, uh, find someone who she respected in business, whatever it may be. She ended up going to do an internship with Chick-fil-A. She ended up working for Home Depot Corporate um, before we got married. And one of the things that she would do was, was find someone like I talked about before and ask questions and glean from that person. Um, it wasn't about what you know, it was about who you know. <laughs> and that's something that we've all heard. You know, it's not about what you know. There could be someone who gets great grades and you know, they have the best GPA, but, right. but they're not someone that's relational. Many times that person isn't the one that gets the job. Maybe that person's not the one that gets the promotion. It's because they've created these relationships. And what she would always tell me, because I'm not the relationship type person. I'm more like, I'm gonna do my thing. We were talking about this backstage. We're like, we're too introverts up here on stage, <laughs> pretending to be extroverts. <laughs> but my wife is the total opposite. So she's like, you know, if you wanna get anywhere, you gotta make relationships. Um, you, have to, you have to challenge yourself. You have to be willing to take risks. The who and, you know is also 
combined with the relationships of how well you know them. Exactly. It happens in coaching all the time. Yeah. Well, this guy got this job at the Falcons. Well, that's great, but what's your relationship with him? Yeah. Did you, did you add value or, or did you lift them up in their life? Are they something that want to invest in you? Like the relationship has to be something that you're invested in one another. Exactly. Does that make sense? Exactly. So I guess practically speaking, you know, when you leave the, the cocoon of the university and you go into the real world, um, the scary real world, um, you know, it's about creating relationships. And, and it's, about, um, it's about identifying those who you want to become like. It's about having heroes. I mean, we all have heroes in the sports world. There's heroes that we have in the business world. There's heroes that we have in, in humanitarianism and things like that. Um, and so when you get into these organizations, these corporations, um, it is about being quiet and receiving, but also being someone who's reliable, being someone who can be counted on, um, being accountable. Those things all add to your credibility when it comes to leadership. Those are the things that I've learned in, in no football. Doubt. Um, a guy who has, who has been there and done it repeatedly at a very high level demands a certain amount of respect, as they should. You mentioned your heroes. Who, who are your heroes? <laughs> uh, well, growing up, uh, my father was my hero. Uh, my father was my hero growing up. He still is. That's awesome. Um, I still don't think I can beat him. <laughs> and he's like, he's like 60. He's 61. I don't know if I can beat him yet. He's got that, he's got that old man strength now, you know. <laughs> Before, before it was, he had that grown man straight, now he's got that, oh, he still don't want to run up on my dad, you know what I mean? Um, but he, he's, he, was, he is my hero as a father, as a, as a leader, as a husband, um, as a provider for our, for our family growing up, um, his character, his integrity. Um, and those are things that are, that are important as well, no matter what you're in, is, is being a person of integrity, being a person of, of, of moral character, being someone um, who, who, uh, who, uh, who can be trusted. You know, uh, we, we are suffering from a gap, I think, uh, in our culture uh, when it comes to integrity. A lot of times it's not held in high esteem anymore. Um, but it's something that we should all, uh, all try, to, try to accomplish. And so my father was my number one. In sports, I loved a guy named Jerry Rice. And, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know Jerry Rice, Jerry Rice was one of the greatest receivers ever. Um, I remember seeing film of him in practice practicing. One coach I had had this old grainy film of Jerry Rice practicing and he was practicing like it was a game. I mean he was running his routes full speed and all those things and you wonder why you'd see these guys and they perform well when the lights are on. Well it's because they did everything behind the scenes that nobody saw them doing. So when nobody was watching he was working out and he was doing the things in practice like it was a, in a game. He was preparing himself for the times when the lights turned on. And so to me that you know let me know if I wanted to be great in whatever I was doing um, it was going to take discipline. Sure. It was going to take hard work. It was going to take, um, you know, me, me maybe sacrificing, doing some other things because I had this goal. That's the gold standard for coaches. I mean, if you have a guy like Jerry Rice on your roster, you're like, hey, don't look at me. Look at him. Exactly. Okay. He, he's, he's, like you talked about reliability. Talk, I mean, the longevity of his career is fascinating. I mean, he sets mm -hmm. every receiving record there is. But it's like what you said, it's, it's the work that he did, it's how hard he trained, mm -hmm. trying to get our guys to practice hard. I mean, I mean you look at a guy like Benjamin Watson. So, so he's Watson, out there he the while we're practicing. And so he, he's, 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 only, he's the, he was one of the coaches. So he's one of the people that we're just like, <laughs> I'm the other. Would you stop yelling at us and blowing the whistle? Please. <laughs> Leave us alone. <laughs> but it's easy, right? I mean, if you have a guy that's, that's setting the example for you, I mean, hey, you know, your teammate's doing it, and he's the best in the league. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about Belichick and Brady. Um, two different types I, of guys. I don't know. I don't know. If, you know, they might, they might still have some wounds from that Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want to bring that up in this room? <laughs> you, you saw those guys firsthand, day in, day out, as a rookie. And yeah. you were there for five or six years. Six years, yeah. How did your relationship, or first of all, what did you learn from them? And how did that relationship evolve over time? as your career in New England you know, ran its course? Yeah, so I, you know, when I came in in 2004 in New England after leaving Georgia, uh, I get there and there's this guy, this coach named Bill Belichick, and he stands up in the meetings and he's yelling at us and he's telling us what to tell the media and he's saying other things about the media. Um, you've seen him in his press conferences. Um, but he had a track, track record of, of, of having, they had just come off of a Super Bowl, and that year, my rookie year, we, we won another one. Um, 
And one of his biggest things that he would say, you know, we would come to work every day, and he'd have a sign on the wall. It's, when we got there, I can't believe I remember this. Um, <laughs> it would say, when you come here, pay attention, do your job, uh, put the team first, and be on time when you got there. Those were the four things. When you came in, you know, that can apply to anything, you know, doing your job. His big thing was, was doing your job and doing it well. I can, I can sit here like it was yesterday, Benjamin, do your job. <laughs> and do it well. And that's it, no more, no less. And what his point was, was that each of us has a specific job. Um, even as students, um, whatever job, uh, organization you're gonna go into, you're gonna have a specific job. And the point is, you work best, or you work best with your team when you do your specific job well. Not anybody else's, because yours is important. As a father, it's important that I teach my children, that I'm affectionate toward my children, that I discipline my children, that my children can look at me and say, you know what, my dad, he's not perfect, but I trust him, he has my best interest at heart, he will sacrifice for me, he provides for me, he leads me, he's my covering, I gotta do my job. It's for my wife to look at me and say, you know what, my husband, he's not perfect, but I know he loves me, I know that he has my best interest. I know he's a, a spiritual leader for me. All those things, doing your job, not doing anybody else's. And so what his point was, and I, I learned over time that you know that's why, that's why that organization is successful. There, there are, are companies who go to New England and figure out why you guys win all the time. <laughs> like what is it, do you have better players? I mean yeah, you got good players, everybody has good players. Do you have better plays? Um, I mean, yeah, they got great coaches, don't get me wrong. They do a lot of game planning, stuff like that. They have really good plays. But everybody knows what their job is and they do it and they're committed to it. And there's this idea, although not perfectly, obviously we all are subject to be jealous and selfish and want to be me people, of course, that's, that's how we are as people. Um, but there's this overarching atmosphere and environment there that you're going to come here and you're going to play your role and the team is going to be successful. And guys uh, have bought into that. So I would say over the course of my career there, um, I, I, I kind of started learning that. And it was amazing when I went to other places um, on some other teams, you could see that that wasn't the environment and then you understood why they weren't successful collectively. The important thing from a coach's perspective and a leader's perspective, hearing what Benjamin had to say, the whole do your job thing, as a leader, shouldn't it be their job to define your role so you know exactly what role you're supposed to be doing well? Yeah. I mean. There's a balance there. So as you get into your career and as your career evolves, it all of a sudden becomes, okay, I'm supposed to be doing my job, doing it well, but also now part of my job is to define, is to define the next guy's job. Yeah, of course, of course. Part, part of the job as, as you go, as you said, is, is, is mentorship. Sure. And it's, um, it's outside of the realm of your stated role as a, as a player or as a worker. Um, so, there, so for example, you know, guys coming to the NFL, um, you know, they're 20, 21, 22 years old. Some, some of these rookies, I mean, we got some rookies on our team that are 20 years old. They can't even drink yet, <laughs> legally. <laughs> I'm on campus, I know. Um, they can't even drink yet, but, they, but they're getting a check for a couple million dollars and they're playing on national television and they may be going to the Super Bowl. Young guys. Um, and so as, as you have more life experience, you know, they look at me as like this old guy, like, man, you, I used to play with you on Madden, you know, back in the day. You know? <laughs> Golly, you know, what, what, what was it like back then? You know, they asked me these, like, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and, so, and so in every career, there's a different lifespan. So in football, the lifespan is like three and a half years is the average. You know, so once you start getting around six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I'm going on, you know, 14. I've been married for over a decade, have kids. Um, you know, they, they look at me as, as, someone who has more answers than they do. And so they come to me. And so part of the culture of any organization is how well do your accomplished uh, veterans or those who have been in it for a while, how, how is their relationship with the new people coming in? One thing that the Ravens do um, that I haven't seen on any other team, although this happens organically in other teams, is one thing that they do is, is they have a, a, a mentorship program that they actually put together. I've never seen it being, be so intentional where they actually match uh, veteran players with rookies. And a lot of times it's across 
positions. It might be on the same side of the ball, offense, defense. But the point is that, you know, you're a veteran player. This guy's a rookie. He has so many things going on in his life. He's in a new city. You know, I, I, I went to Georgia, and then I go to Boston, and I don't even have a winter coat. Like, <laughs> I had never seen that much snow. It snowed 84 inches my rookie year. Wow. I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I thought a snow shovel was just like a shovel that you just use it with snow. I didn't know that. It, I didn't know it had a different shape. I had no idea. You know, so even things like that, they're away from home for the first time. They're, they're dealing with these pressures of performing every single day. Um, and so one thing the Ravens has done is actually match you up. And so you talk about, you know, what are these guys' values? A, a, lot, of, a lot of young players are still trying to search for who do they want to be? What do they want to represent? Um, they got a million people pulling at them in different ways. They have money for the first time. Where am I going to spend it? What am I going to do? Um, you know, everybody doesn't have their best interests at heart. And so it's about uh, help, helping them navigate that, but also being, being a soft sounding board. Um, someone who is non judgmental. Um, you know, you have these conversations with the rookies and they're able to, you know, be honest about things. Sometimes you have breakthroughs. Sometimes it doesn't, a breakthrough doesn't happen until, you know, five or six conversations. Maybe it doesn't happen. Uh, but, but it's a really positive thing because um, we do feel like we have a responsibility to, to reach back to those who are, who are new. Awesome. So um, talking about doing your job and to kind of cap this, this segment off, we have a video, and I'm sure you've seen this thing a million times. Shoot, you went through it. <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and play it, and then we'll kind of... Uh, At the New England Patriots headquarters in Foxborough, Massachusetts, every picture tells a story of a win. In our locker room here and in our meeting rooms and around this building, we have hundreds of pictures up on the wall, and they're all pictures from games that we've won, and they're either from successful plays that we've made or players showing enthusiasm or support for their teammates after they've made those plays. I've always told the team, I don't care if you score five touchdowns if we lose, there's no chance that picture will be up on the wall. If there was ever a picture to put up there from a losing game, I think this would be it. It's fitting that play would occur under a full moon. It would feature an interception thrown by a quarterback who had never lost a postseason game and a 100-yard return by one of the fastest players in the league, which would not result in a touchdown. Third and goal. Brady takes the snap. Here's the blitz. Rolls to the right. Fires to the right. It is intercepted in the end zone. Up to 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Left sideline, 35, 40. Heading all the way down the sideline. Foot race. Bailey stepped out of a tackle. Chad Bailey, 30, 20, 15, 10, 5. Did he get there? He's hit out of bounds, I think, at the 1. Ben Watson shows the hustle. Doesn't give up on the play. If I would have dogged it, I don't even know that Coach Belichick would have said anything because we lost the game, and it was the last game of the season. If I dogged it, I would have to deal with it myself. Some of my college coach used to tell me was that stuff like that doesn't take a whole bunch of talent. It's just effort. Where did he come from? <laughs> Where did he come from? And we didn't know until replays. We saw Ben was on the other side of the field, so he basically had to run like 120 yards, even longer than that, to get that. Until I saw that, did I truly appreciate about the effort that he put forth. That it was a play that sort of signified a just never giving up. I'm running for a long time. That's what I'm thinking. You don't know if you ever had a helmet on, but when you're running full speed with a helmet on, this is all you see. Everything just bobbling, right? The helmet's bouncing. I remember looking up in the stands and seeing all the Denver fans going crazy. Saw Kevin Falk try to get him. He stepped out of a tackle by Kevin Falk. Then I ran into the ref. There was a point where it kind of turned into like a challenge for me. Kind of like, let's see how fast I can run. Let's see if I can get this guy. I was surprised by the time I got to him because I thought his boys would have tried to pick me up. I think they were tired too. <laughs> so, so they just let me run past. Looking at pictures of it, I don't even think he saw me. I don't think that Champ Bailey felt like Watson was even in the picture. That's one of those 
plays that we'll remember the rest of our lives because I don't think anyone would have given him a shot. That's awesome. <laughs> That's, uh, that was another one of my heroes, though, Champ Bailey. So I kind of felt bad. Uh, <laughs> Funny thing was, Champ ended up, so I played with Boss Bailey here at uh, Georgia, and Champ ended up being on our uh, team in New Orleans for a training camp about two years ago. So we were at training camp, and it was Champ's last year, year, I don't know, 25, whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, you know, he was there in New Orleans with us, and, and not many guys on the team actually you know, remember that. They were you know, in, in high school or middle school when that happened. Uh, and somebody, somebody found it and started talking about it. Was, Hold on, man. Hold on. Didn't you? So it became like a big thing in training camp. <laughs> Everybody was watching the video. We all got some good laughs about it. But uh, you talk about the grainy Jerry Rice film. That's the way that, the film yeah. used to look like. Yeah, they were like when you I guys first started. Have, is there one in HD? I was like, there's no HD. There's no HD. <laughs> that that so was standard that was, def. That, that was HD. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's a lot to unpack from that video. My favorite quote. Is um, and when we used this in Baltimore, you said your coach at Georgia said was, you know, it, it didn't require a lot of talent. It's just effort all the time, and that goes for everybody in their daily life. You don't know when your opportunity is going to come. Shoot, I, I read something about you. You said, you know, you train your whole career about catching all these passes and touchdowns. <laughs> well, arguably your most famous play is a defensive one. <laughs> you know, you don't know when God the opportunity got jokes, is going to come. God got jokes. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm glad you guys enjoyed that. Uh, that, was a great, that was a phenomenal play. Yeah, uh, just, you know, just the, the aspect of perseverance. And, um, you know, when, when I was at Georgia, uh, Coach Rick was a coach here. I played with Coach Rick. Played with Coach Donovan for one year. I had to sit out that year, then Coach Rick came. And one time we were playing Clemson University in Sanford Stadium. It was maybe the first game of the season, I think. And we were on about uh, – they were, we, were, we were on offense, and we were, we were trying to score. We were maybe on the 40-yard line going in, and uh, our running back fumbled the ball, and Clemson picked it up, and the guy ran in for a touchdown. Well, everybody on offense, you know, you're supposed to chase the guy, right? So we started chasing him, but it was obvious that we weren't going to catch him, so we just started peeling off, <laughs> you know, going toward the sideline and kind of gave up on the play. And so the next week in practice, Coach Rick, um, we, I don't even think we practiced. We just ran. He ran us. Because he said, you never give up. You never give up on a play. He said, I don't ever want to see anybody ever giving up on a play. Fast forward, uh, we were playing Alabama and Tuscaloosa. And it was later in that year. It was uh, 100 some degrees in Alabama. And the same thing happened. And uh, somebody fumbled. They picked the ball up. We're on offense. All of us chased him that time. We did not want to run doing extra conditioning at practice. But we all chased him. And I ended up catching him, catching the linebacker on like the one yard line knocked him out of bounds, only to find out that the ref had said he ran out of bounds 50 yards ago. <laughs> <laughs> I wasted all my energy. But one thing my father used to say is that, you know, in everything you do, you give 100%. He would say, if you're going to be a bank robber, be the best bank robber. <laughs> I, want, I want you to give 100% in everything that you do. And his point was that there's this idea of perseverance, is that there's going to be obstacles in your life. Somebody's going to tell you no when you leave here. You're not going to get every job. Some of you guys, I don't know if Georgia was your first choice, but you may have got turned down by a bunch of other schools and then you got accepted by this one. I don't know. There's going to be times when you get injured physically, emotionally. Um, there's going to be different challenges. People are going to make fun of you. All those things are going to happen. You, there's going to be times in your life where you're going to be like, what's happening? And so the idea there is you persevere. You have a stated goal in mind that you want to do, that you want to accomplish, and you keep fighting. And in everything you do, you give 100%. And that not only goes for your, 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 your work life, but it goes for your home life, for your school life, for your spiritual life, um, for your, your social life, emotionally. Um, you give everything to what you do. Um, it, it doesn't mean it's always going to turn out perfectly, but what it does mean um, is that when you have that commitment, when you're committed to something, that's when those good things start to happen. You had mentioned this in the podcast, and I thought it was really powerful when you first got to New England about... Uh, a failure to fail, yeah. right? Could, could you explain in, in, to everybody what you were talking about? Because yeah. it's something I <clears throat> definitely relate to. Yeah, so one of my, I mean, you look in that video, <clears throat> you see that referee getting away. <laughs> he, he was an obstacle. 
Um, but one obstacle that I faced, um, you know, we were talking in the podcast, and you know, obviously playing football is a violent sport, it's a physical sport. Um, uh, you know, you're going to break bones, you're going to tear an Achilles tendon like I just did last year. Um, things like that are going to happen. But one of the biggest obstacles I had to overcome was uh, my perfectionism. Um, I, I want to be good at everything that I do. Um, that's off the field, on the field, and everything. And when I got drafted to New England, I got drafted to a place where you're supposed to do your job, where there was a very high standard, where all those things that are good, but for the person that's the perfectionist, it was, it was, it was hard for me. Absolutely. It was tough. I struggled there for a good four years. Emotionally, I was depleted. I was bordering on being depressed. I was getting stress headaches because it was okay for someone else to make a mistake. <clears throat> I would give them grace, but I wouldn't give myself the same grace. It wasn't okay for me. I, my expectations for myself were way, way too high. And what it did was, I think that in my professional career, for my first few years, it prevented me from achieving my highest potential because I was scared to mess up. I didn't want, I didn't want to be on the video, I didn't want to be the guy messing up on the video. And I wasn't but also wasn't the guy making the best plays on the video because I wasn't allowing myself the freedom to fail in order to accomplish greatness. And so through a series of events, counseling, conversations, um, even things in my childhood that I had to overcome, stuff like that, um, I was able to experience freedom. Uh, many of us walk around in bondage, and I'm not talking about chains, I'm talking about mental bondage, I'm talking about um, emotional bondage because we think our worth is tied up in how we perform. And if there's one lesson that I, I learned throughout my career is that as bad as I want to be a great football player and as bad as you should be a, a great accountant or, um, uh, or whatever it is in finance or marketing, whatever it is you're going to be when you leave here, as bad as you want to be great at that, your worth as a person when you leave here can never be tied up in how well you do your job it will destroy you. You will be in bondage. You may be having a good paycheck. People may put you in magazines. People may wanna, want you to be their mentor. People may look at you and say, oh, this person left Georgia and they're doing great things. But you'll be in bondage if your self-worth is tied up to what you do because eventually at some point, what you do isn't gonna go the way you want it to be. But if you allow those things to separate, which is what I struggled with, my self-worth was tied up. If I had a great day of practice, I was happy. If I had a poor day of practice, I was coming home to my wife cursing and didn't want to talk and things like that. But allowing, the, allowing me to understand that my worth was not tied up in that, that I had value as a person, first and foremost, allowed me to excel at the other things that I did. It's powerful. It's good stuff. Let's change gears here a little bit. Uh, let's first talk about your first book. As you mentioned earlier, <laughs> number two is on its way. Yeah, um, under our skin, getting yes. real about race. I, I wanted to talk about leading with differences, and, and eventually get to that. But why don't you share kind of your goals, how the book came about with everyone, and then we, we can go from there. Yeah. So my my, my first book, um, uh, under our skin, getting real about race, getting free from the fears and frustrations that divide us, is really a commentary. Um, and also part memoir about my experience with the topic of race. Um, uh, I've been black for 36 years, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> um, you know, so I've experienced this thing firsthand. Um, <laughs> but as we look over the course of the last few years, there have been a number of, of, of racially charged incidents that have happened. I mean, I, I think that I was, I was looking at a, a Gallup poll uh, that just came out. It said that, that, that right now, 42% of Americans are very concerned about the topic and everything about it with race. If you look at the black community, it's up to 60 something percent. Um, and, and it's at its highest levels um, since back in the 50s and 60s. And so this is clearly something that keeps coming up in TV. We talk about it, some of us don't talk about it. We have, we're scared to be labeled. Sometimes we don't know how to approach it. We don't know what to say. Um, we don't know whether to cry, whether to forgive, or whether to, to, to change the whole system. I mean, it's so complex. I mean, there's layers upon layers. And after Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, I wrote this Facebook post just about my feelings, um, just seeing what was happening on TV. Um, and I wrote about being angry, about being sad, about being introspective, about, about being sympathetic, um, about being hopeless, because it's like, man, it seems like we're not getting anywhere, but also being hopeful and finally being encouraged. Because I do believe that the gospel gives us hope when it comes to this situation of race. And so 
the Facebook post. I didn't even know how to post to Facebook at the time. <laughs> we didn't have Facebook when I was in college. Then I posted Facebook, sent it to somebody else to post it. It went viral. And so the book is basically an expansion of all those emotions that many of us, black, white, whatever, bring into this whole um, situation of race. And being honest about those and trying to encourage people to have these types of tough conversations that are authentic, um, where real change can happen. And also you may see something and experience something that you didn't even know existed. My eyes are continually being open to people's experiences, black and white. I mean, I, you know, reading books and having conversations and things like that. So that book came out a couple years ago. Um, it's still, you know, people are still, uh, you know, talking about it. And really, my whole my whole hope was that I wanted to create an opportunity for those who want to see, to have some sort of understanding, maybe to see some sort of change, to have an avenue to do so. Because a lot of times, when it comes to this topic specifically. We don't like talking about it. We either deny it or we're, we've been so hurt by it that we can't even uh, express our feelings when it comes to it. What's your advice for getting over those hurdles? I mean, these conversations are necessary, whether it be about race yeah. or anything that, that, that creates a difference between you and your peer. I mean, of course. what are some ad, uh, pieces of advice you have for us to, you know, to, to take well, those even, on? Well, even in the workplace. So you, know, you guys are going to leave here and go to work. I mean, this is a workplace. A campus is a workplace as well. Um, but on my team, you know, a lot of times we talk about, well, you know, we, we come from different backgrounds, we work toward the same goal, and all that's true. But you know what? Me and you could share a locker, and we could go out, and we could bleed and sweat and have victories and losses. I can never know anything about you. So one of the first steps, obviously, is being in proximity with each other, but we need to go deeper than that. And the only way you are allowed to go deeper is if you and I have a relationship. If if you're simply in proximity to people with different backgrounds, that's not good enough. If you're willing to enter into their experience, if you're willing to open up yourself to maybe some things that you've thought that were wrong, or maybe some things you thought that were right, have a challenging conversation, be willing to ask them some questions and then not jump down your throat because you have a relationship there, that's a great place to start. And so, um, you know, even in our locker room, the, 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 there have been guys, and I talk about it in my book, and I talk about you know, a teammate that I had who, white guy, offensive tackle. I played right beside this guy for, for three years, right? Um, he, he has a, a, a niece who uh, is, is black, and all of a sudden, many of these things, when it comes to race, are becoming more real to him. And so we've had conversations um, about, you know, Black Lives Matter, and are they crazy or are they not crazy? <laughs> uh, we had conversations about, do the police really talk to black people, or are black people just committing way too many crimes? We've had conversations about, what, on, what, what about black on black crime, or what about white on white crime? <laughs> We've had these real conversations because we have a relationship to do so. Right. And there's been change and understanding that's happened because we have the relationship. And then from that point, we can have our eyes opened and, and see what we need to do as far as creating justice for people. You know, I was going to ask you, after you answer that question, what happens next, but it seems like it's really what happens before the conversation. Is there a foundation there yeah. that allows you to have those conversations with those people at the level that you're talking about? Of course, and I'm always about action. So we, we, had, a, we had a forum a little while ago um, in Tampa, Florida, kind of based on the book, and we had a number of, of, of well-known people come and and share some people from the sports world, some people from journalism, politics. We have people come together and, and obviously the conversation, but then it's like, okay, you know, what do I do? What can I do? Um, and I think that it obviously starts with a conversation. And it's amazing in those conversations how your specific talents or your specific interests, interests will be spurred and you'll know what to do next. But you'll never understand or you'll never even have a feeling um, if you don't ever address the topic. And it's going to take courage. You know, many of us, we all live in a specific realm, a specific sphere. Um, we have a group think. So if I'm a 30-something-year-old black guy who grew up here and my friends look like this, this is how we think. If you're a white teenager from this place um, and you go to this church, you all think the same way. A lot of times what happens is if we step outside of that, heaven forbid, you have to be willing to lose some relationships. As you go through your life, if you're ever going to stand for something that's worth standing for, you have to be willing 
to maybe lose some relationships in your group. Because a lot of people aren't going to, a lot of people don't want any sort of, they don't want any sort of peace. They want you to think the way that they think. Um, and so that was one way that we challenged them is that, you know what, it's going to take courage. It takes courage to stand for things sometimes that aren't, that aren't popular. What does that look like? Maybe you can expand upon it, what that looks like inside the locker room. And, and, and can you, based on how those dynamics and those conversations work, is that indicative of team success or is this something that you have to constantly work through over the course of a season, yeah. you know, to make it work? You know, if, what's Baltimore's locker room like, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, well, team success, and we were talking about this earlier, um, teams a lot of times take on the characteristics of their leadership. And I don't think that's any different than any organization. Um, you know, Dean Ayers, the way he is, his character, um, eventually is going to permeate the business school. It's going to permeate Terry. Um, you guys are going to be little Dean Ayers walking around here, you know, <laughs> because of his leadership. You know, when, we go, when I go somewhere with my five kids, we go through the airport, you got, you got five little Kirsten and Benjamin Watsons. And if, and if somebody were to meet one of them, then they should say, okay, I can see a little bit of you guys in them. Sure. And so when it comes to a team, it's the same way. Um, you know, we talked about Belichick. I, I played for Sean Payton, um, Mangini, a number of different people in different places. And, and the teams usually take on the characteristics, good and bad, of the leadership. And sometimes that correlates, many, most of the time that correlates to winning. Um, if, if, if it is someone who you know, has a high level of you know, what, whatever it be, integrity or discipline or whatever, the, they're consistent, they're able to handle success as well as handle failure. A lot of people can't, can't handle success. A lot of people have success once or twice, whatever it is, and, and, and as we say, it goes to their head, and, and they're not able to, to duplicate the same uh, process that got them the success in the first place. And the teams that you see that are successful, the leadership in that locker room as well as the leadership from the top is consistent. Let's talk right now. Okay. Oh yeah, we got it. Man, that went fast. We That's all the time we have. We got a red end. Uh, e N D, and she has it. <laughs> it's her fault. Sorry to embarrass you. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's all the time we have. Do we have we have time for a couple of questions? Maybe one question, right here in the front. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for being here. And on behalf of Isla and Terry, we wish you best of luck with your recovery for your injury. Um, my name is William Kirk. I'm a fourth year marketing major. And my question is, what do you think the largest challenge is for that leaders face uh, moving forward? Uh, the largest challenge that leaders face moving forward? Um, I think um, the, the, the atmosphere in our country right now there is, remember I mentioned the group think, and people, no matter where you side on, on the political spectrum, I've seen a lot of people being bullied into thinking a certain way. And then if, and we always talk about being tolerant and allowing people to express their views and, a different, and different views. Um, and, and you know, this is America, so if you're Christian or if you're this or uh, Muslim or you know, conservative or if you're liberal, um, it's okay. We can all you know, accept each other's views. But I haven't seen a lot of that lately. What I've seen is when people um, express certain views, they're labeled a certain way, and they express other views they're labeled. And I've actually heard, seen people who want to speak out and want to lead from a certain perspective but they're getting bombarded with stuff that's not even true about them. And so my, my point in all that um, is just saying that the challenge for a leader is to be authentic to his leadership or, or his or her leadership style and to their values and to their convictions. That's the challenge. Because we are increasingly living in a time where there is a sense of conformity. Um, there is pressure to conform um, from many different forces. Uh, and it's going to be tougher and tougher to stand for your convictions and for, and for what you believe. Um, that's, that's, that's the toughest thing for, for leaders right now. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Um, on behalf okay. of... Okay. <laughs> on behalf of... Y'all got to go play. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I hope there's, I hope there's, is there money in here? <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> well, on behalf of um, the Institute for Leadership Advancement and the Terry Leadership Speaker Series, we are so thankful that Benjamin and Mike got to be here with us today. Um, we also want to thank all of you for coming. Um, on your pamphlet, you can fill out the Who You Are form and turn it into the buckets on your way out. Also, we're excited to welcome Doug Ben from the Cheesecake Factory on April 14th, and we'll be happy to see you then. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.